Hello there, welcome to the Saroy channel. Do send you loads and loads of love, each and every one of you. And how are you doing? I really hope you're doing well. I'm doing fabulously, thank you very much. And all the better for being with you this evening. Don't forget to go and get that quintessential glass of whatever it is that you drink. And if you drink something unusual, you know that I want to hear about it. So before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, I will never ever forget the sombre, dingy and subdued dark day of my dad's funeral. Even the weather did not smile as the blue sky was dramatically eclipsed by a smouldering darkness that blanketed and enveloped it in a foreboding telltale sign that told us that a storm was brewing. My emotions were far too numb to even feel anything at all, for the shock of my dad's sudden passing had left my stomach twisted in knots and my thoughts confiscated by both denial and disbelief. I watched my poor mother's heartbroken, sorrowful face throw white lilies on top of his wooden coffin into the open grave, while everyone clustered around the site like a flock of penguins to bid their final farewells to my beloved father. They mopped away tears from their faces with large handkerchiefs, while they gathered under the wide brim parasols of their umbrellas as it bucketed down with rain for it seemed that even the full clouds in the oppressive dark sky could not contain their tears of sadness, for a great soul had indeed left our world. As you can imagine, no one had expected my father to die so suddenly and fortuitously, so it would seem that his abrupt, unpredicted demise had hit us like a cruel blow in the lower guts. What had started as a rather fun day out turned out to be the worst, most harrowing, traumatic day of my life, for I was completely unprepared for what was about to unfold. It was a beautiful spring day in New York, and after an invigorating walk in the verdant green park, full of dog walkers and joggers, our family of four had visited a diner on the east side of Manhattan in New York, which abuts the East River facing Brooklyn and Queens. We had learnt that this particular diner had one of New York's best pizza slices, and my father considered himself a connoisseur when it came to deciding whether a pizza had the perfect amount of crispness from the base, sweetness and saltiness from the tomato sauce, and wasn't dominated by an excess of cheese. The high-spirited hip diner smelt of melted cheese, garlic and olive oil, and the delicious smell enveloped the air, causing my stomach to rumble hungrily. On this occasion, the diner had an even more energetic, animated ambience than usual, and people were buzzing around the place like bees around a honeypot, armed with delectable pizza slices dribbling with stringy mozzarella and glasses of white wine. It looked as if they were preparing to watch an exciting show, and it seemed I wasn't wrong in my brief assessment. "'What is all this fuss about?' my father asked the manager. "'It's very lively in here. What's going on?' "'I know,' said the manager." We have quite a party here this afternoon. It's the pizza-eating competition, he informed us proudly. We promote it every year. If you can manage to eat a massive, huge pizza that could feed a dozen people under 30 minutes, you will have pride of place on our Hall of Fame, he said, pointing to the photographs on the wood-panelled wall of previous winners all smiling gleefully into the camera. You can win a hundred dollars, a t-shirt and a free pizza for life at our diner. The question is, are you up to the challenge, she asked my father. You look like a man who has an eye for adventure. Go on, I dare you. Give it a go. We do need more contestants. My father was about six foot three, lanky and lean, but he also enjoyed eating and had always loved his food, most especially Italian. I'll give it a go, he said. Why not? How hard can it be? Besides, I am getting rather hungry. Good for you, said the manager. Really, Dad, I said excitedly. Are you really going to enter? Why not, my father said. It'll be fun. 
"'I'm not sure it's a good idea, sweetheart,' said my mother, looking worried. "'You're up against people who do this kind of thing for big money. "'You're a novice.' "'Sweetheart,' said my father, kissing my mother lovingly on the cheek. "'It's only a pizza-eating competition. "'For goodness sake! "'I'm not about to attempt a tightrope on the Empire State Building. "'How much harm can it do?' It's only a bit of fun. I think there were seven people in the competition, each being presented a pizza the size of a small tabletop. And when the bell rang, they began to dive into their pizzas with haste, while the effervescent, vivacious people at the diner were egging them on excitedly, and the cheering from the enthusiastic crowd really encouraged the eaters to get stuck into their pizzas with haste. I noticed that some of the contestants barely even bothered to chew their food, but swallowed it down with copious amounts of water as quickly as they could, as it was some kind of technique. My father was trying his level best to compete with some of these professionals, and he really began to struggle and beaver away at his pizza, taking large bites and chewing them as fast as he could. But even though he was lagging behind the other contestants, he wasn't about to lose heart. "'Go on, Dad!' my brother and I shouted encouragingly. "'You know you can do it! We have faith in you!' The crowd was so motivating that my father just didn't want to give up. Finally, he had enough. He looked as if he was blue in the face and got up and pushed the pizza away from him and then suddenly he passed out and collapsed on the floor. In moments, the emergency services arrived hurriedly on the scene and tried their level best to unblock all the pizza dough caught up in my father's throat by using the Heineck manoeuvre and other techniques, one that involved cutting an airway with a knife, but by the time he got to the hospital, the ambulance had pronounced him dead. It seemed that despite their best efforts, his air passage was so heavily blocked with dough, it had become like superglue and wedged in his passageway, and he had lost consciousness in his struggle to breathe. It was a devastating, catastrophic loss for the all of us. I was completely astonished that a pizza-eating competition could result in my dad's sudden passing away, and never in a million years would I have envisaged losing him over a pizza, but stranger things have happened in our lives. We had to buckle up and get on with life, but I'm not going to pretend it was easy for any of us, because it most certainly wasn't. Life without my father was gruelingly hard, but with a life insurance policy behind her, my mother was able to continue to send us to good schools and to buy the apartment where we lived in New York. One day my mother told me that she was getting married and that she had a new mystery man in her life whom she would introduce us to over dinner that night. I wish I could say I was pleased for her, but I was completely gutted as I couldn't bear the idea of my father being replaced, which is only natural for a son to feel that way. I've been feeling very lonely and forsaken, my mother told us. You kids are my world, but what happens when you finally leave home and I'm left all on my own? I'll feel so alone, desolate and abandoned, which is more than I can bear. I understand, Mum, I said, taking her lovingly in my arms. I mean, I think I do, but it's so hard to imagine you with someone else other than Dad. Look, sweetheart, said my mother, looking at me intently, and then at my brother William. You boys need to know that no one in this world will ever replace your father. Do you understand that? He was the love of my life. No one else will ever be able to measure up to him. Besides, let's face it, God broke the mould when he made your father. There's no one out there like him at all. I bet he's up in heaven, having a huge laugh about choking on a pizza and dying as a result. You know your father. He always saw the funny side of everything. Well, why do you have to marry this man, said William sulkily. You don't love him, do you? Love him? Heavens no, said my mother. But I am very fond of him, and I like him quite a lot. And that is a good start. It's a promising foundation for a future. At this stage of my life, I'm really just looking for friendship, security and love. I told you, I don't want to be alone. It really is that simple. I think I'm really rather afraid of loneliness. 
and I do know that your father would understand my dilemma. He would never begrudge me some happiness. You know that. Of course we do. But has this man ever been married before? I asked. His name is Chris Tedder. And yes, Simon, he has been married before. Five times, actually. I'll be the sixth wife, which is a bit of a sobering thought, I have to admit. Five times, Mum, I said, gasping. Are you kidding, Mum? What on earth are you thinking? Have you completely lost leave of your senses? Sorry, Mum, no offence, but this needs to be said, and the truth can be hard to take, but it needs saying. You can't just marry someone who's been married that many times before. You're asking for trouble. What happened to all his previous wives? Simon, you're just like your father. Look at you, so overprotective and nurturing. And I really appreciate that you care. Really, I do. But I need you boys to support me tonight. I need you to have my back. We're going to a Mexican restaurant in town. It, I gather, has a good reputation. And I want the two of you to be very, very nice to Chris. Do you understand? We both nodded in agreement. So there we were, sitting at a large table in a Mexican restaurant in East Manhattan with a buzzing hip vibe. We were waiting for Chris to arrive. And then we saw him. My first impression of him was not good because he was grinning from ear to ear with his white gleaming gnashes as he approached the table, which really was rather full on for my liking. Should he not be a little more restrained when approaching the children of his future wife for the very first time? Chris was about six foot four, with a scattering of thin brown hair and unlined face with pale blue, shifty looking eyes, and he was wearing a pair of blue jeans and a loose white shirt with the sleeves rolled up. I suppose he wasn't too bad looking, but he wasn't even remotely like my father. Not that that was a bad thing, of course, but I didn't understand the attraction on my mother's part. As far as I could see, he wasn't much of a catch. My mother could have done so much better. That's what I thought privately to myself. Chris took my hand to shake it. Please to meet you, Simon. I've heard all about you from your mother. I held his limp, clammy hand in mine, and that was a bright red flag for me. Did his weak, pathetic handshake reveal how insipid, wishy-washy and bland a character he really was beneath the surface, I secretly wondered. I watched as he sat down next to my mother, kissing and slobbering her tenderly on the cheek and keeping his arms tightly pinned over her shoulders as if he was guarding her, which I found disturbing. I didn't like a stranger's arm dangling around my mother. It really was rather unsettling and discomposing. So, Chris, I said, my mother tells me you've been married five times. Is that right? My mother was virtually pleading me with her earnest eye movements to stop this manner of awkward questioning because it was very embarrassing for her, but I didn't care. If I made this man squirm like an octopus in a bucket, well, so be it. I was going to get him pumping out black ink by the time the evening was over. I felt certain about that. Your mother informs you well, said Chris. I was very young, in those early marriages of mine. I chose women that did not compliment my personality. But things are very different now, and these days I'm much more discerning and far less naive, which is why your mother has so graciously accepted my proposal of marriage and has made me a very happy man indeed. Is that so, I said, with an air of sarcasm. You make marriage sound like you're investing in a piece of furniture. My mother is not a piece of furniture. She's not for sale. Chris laughed. You have a comical son here, Caroline, he said jokingly. But I could see his eyes looked exceedingly annoyed. All of a sudden, an attractive waitress arrived at our table with long, dark auburn hair and bright blue eyes and I did notice Chris giving her an approving once-over, which made me cringe inside with disgust. The young woman began to take everybody's orders down, and then the conversation meandered away, drifting on to other topics, but there were moments that I did observe Chris glancing at me warily, 
as if to say, I can see that I have a difficult boy here to deal with. I think he could almost potentially smell the problems that I might bring to their future relationship. Good, I thought. Do you have any children, Chris? I asked. Ah, uh, yes. As it happens, I do. I have two daughters and a son, and they live in Portugal. I never get to see them, he said. You never told me you had any children, said my mother, looking at Chris with a very disheartened expression on her face. You should have told me. That was very important. Perhaps you shouldn't be rushing into marriage, I suggested gleefully. It seems like there's not much you know about each other yet, I said sarcastically, as I couldn't resist the urge to dig. I wasn't nice, I'm afraid. Now, Simon, there's no need to dig the knife in so hard, my mother scolded. I do apologise, Chris. Simon is very rude and very tactless, I'm afraid. Well, Simon, I do happen to understand where you're coming from. I know it can't be easy to see your mother with another man after your dad's tragic passing. Yes, I acknowledge that your mother and I do not know a lot about each other. But that will change as we grow together in a loving marriage. But I know that our relationship will be a voyage of discovery. And by the way things are going, it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful adventure for the both of us. He said, reaching for my mother's hand and squeezing it tightly. I wanted to throw up. I really did. And judging by William's expression, he felt as nauseous as I did. We gave each other furtive glances, and William gave me a sizable eye roll. In a private moment together, we discussed our mother's newfound love. I tried not to observe Chris through your prejudicial eyes, said William, because let's face it, you're so overprotective over mother, I didn't think that you were ever going to like this man, even if he had been a saint, but a saint he is not. I have to admit there's something about Chris that gives me the creeps and makes my skin crawl. I think we need to find out more about Chris before he walks down the aisle with mother. Dad would expect us to watch her back. You know how naive and trusting she can be. We have to protect her for her own good. We have to make sure she doesn't make a grievous mistake. There's something very dodgy and nefarious about this man. I feel it in my gut. Me too, I agreed. And so it was my brother and I worked tirelessly to find out everything we could about Chris Tedder. And from what we'd established, he was indeed a serial womanizer, whose marriages had failed and all but ended as a result of adulterous affairs and the wives, of course, having found out about Chris's perfidious and unchaste moonlighting with other women. I was certain my mother had no knowledge of his previous philandering exploits and was under the false misguided impression that Chris's marriages had irretrievably broken down as a result of having so little in common with his wives, but that was very clearly not the case. My brother and I spoke to three of his ex-wives, and none of them had a single good word to say about him and were virtually spitting like vipers at the mere mention of his name. We were told he was a traitorous, wayward, cheating, lying, weak man. We were soon to establish that my mother was planning to marry a man who simply couldn't keep his hands off other women. We were very fortunate to take video footage of him touching up young girls so inappropriately at bars and clubs who were young enough to be his own daughters. He was flirting and chatting them up while he claimed to my mother that he was out entertaining clients to dinner on a business capacity. Seeing him wolfing around like this made my brother and I literally want to vomit. Our plan was to present Chris with the evidence of his philandering misdemeanours so he could end things with my mother very cordially and swiftly without any hard feelings or upset. Otherwise we would show her the video footage we had uncovered about him. So yes... We were blackmailing him for the greater good by saving my mother from this deplorable wretch whose only interest was in pleasing and satisfying his own perverse appetites. A day later, my mother announced to us that we were all going on a camping holiday together as a prelude before officially we became a family and Chris and her finally ran off into the sunset just to tie the knot on a tropical island somewhere. I think it'll be a great idea for you boys to get to know Chris a lot better as he will be moving in with us after I get married to him. 
I think we should break the ice first before that happens, so I thought hiking, barbecuing and a bit of fishing together will be very bonding for all of us, and I'm sure you'll get to love Chris. He's a good man, so please give him a chance. I know he's not your father, but try to be nice to him, just for my sake, she begged us. Well, where are we going, I asked. We're flying to West Virginia tomorrow. It's a very short hour and twenty minute flight, and then we're going to hire a jeep and we're going to drive to Cumbrabo State Forest in Randolph County, where we've hired a cabin for a few nights. Sounds lovely, I said, trying to sound enthusiastic, although my heart was sinking at the very idea of seeing Chris again, but I did look forward to showing him the video evidence of his philandering and flirtatious ways, and I hoped that we would see the end of this complete moron for good. Before long we were driving down a gravel road in the jeep that we'd hired, that led to one of the primitive pioneer log cabins, where everything was made from very dark stained sawed lumber, with the exception of a traditional stone fireplace. The arcaden wooden walls and ceilings were graced with gas lanterns, and there was an intimate wood-burning stove, and it really gave the cabin a cosy, warm, organic feeling, which you do not get in conventional homes. And the rustic, home-style, mellow appearance and simplicity of the decor really did give us a taste of life in those bygone days when in 1650 the British pioneers had established a solid base here in West Virginia. The Arcadian cabin was situated in the middle of the woods, surrounded by gorgeous statuesque spruce and hemlock trees, and there were crystal clear streams strewn with sculptural boulders that meandered through the valley. It was mesmerisingly pretty, and we had spotted numerous deer scampering around the countryside, and even a couple of brown bears foraging for berries on the side of the precipitous dirt road. For the first couple of days, my brother and I were on our best behaviour. We would go hiking with Chris and my mother on some rather precarious narrow overgrown trails, and were able to enjoy breathtaking beguiling views of statuesque mountains, rugged outcrops, flowering meadows and resplendent waterfalls, where streams of white foaming water blasted over the rocks with forceful jets and the gentle spray vaporised over our faces in a misty dew. We also thoroughly enjoyed a spot of very successful trout fishing at the Crystal Lake, and we walked away with some sizeable looking trout, which we grilled at night over the fire pit, and the taste of that melt-in-the-mouth flaky fish served with butter and garlic was absolutely awesome. In the evenings we enjoyed delicious dinners eaten over the fire pit, as everything eaten outdoors is always infinitely more delicious. We talked and laughed over beers, or in my mother's case her drink of choice was ice-cold white wine. We enjoyed the beauty of stargazing at night, and of course listening to the sounds of the crickets and frogs, and we could also hear the distant calls and howls of coyotes. It was different to the city noises of New York, and the traffic and beeping taxi cabs, that we were so used to. Over this period of time we had watched Chris with beady, very discerning eyes, and it hadn't escaped our attention that he would sometimes make his excuses and disappear into a private spot and tap away at his phone, and his furtive behaviour caused my heckles to rise, as I knew that I knew that it was more than likely he was texting other women, and such a thought made me sick to my stomach. Despite everything, my brother and I were determined to make our holiday pleasant before we finally approached Chris with all the evidence. I'm so glad you boys are beginning to come around to liking Chris, my mother said. If that's what you call it, Mum, I said sarcastically. I don't like the man, and neither does William. But we are being pleasant for your sake. Oh dear, oh dear, said my mother. I really don't like the sound of that at all. I'm getting married to him soon, boys. You're going to have to try harder to get on with him. And so it was on the final night of our stay at the National Forest. After dinner, we decided to do a spot of night fishing with Chris. And so armed with our fishing tackle, along with our headlamps, we ambled down some narrow paths until we found ourselves at the lake, where we set up our rods. It was an exquisitely beautiful night, where the bright ivory full moon illuminated the sky and the reflections of the vase-shaped trees and mountainous ridges danced on the surface of the silvery lake, while the night was serenaded by the sounds of frogs and crickets. We all cast out our rods and opened some icy cold beers to drink. My heart was thundering in my chest, and I promptly said, Chris, 
William and I do not want you to marry our mother, as you will only break her heart, and we love our mother too much, and so we need to protect her from you. What are you talking about? said Chris, looking aggrieved. Your mother and I love each other. Why are you so hell-bent on ruining our lives for us? William interceded. We know why your previous marriages ended in disaster and failed. You cheated on every single one of your wives. Now that's disgusting. Chris stumbled on his words. You, 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 you got that all wrong. If that's what my exes told you, they're all lying through their teeth. They just want to get their back on me for leaving them. They don't handle rejection well. You know how vengeful women can be. They can be very vindictive. What's the saying? Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. I very much doubt that your wives are all lying, I said, staring directly in Chris's eyes and noticing that he failed to hold my gaze and promptly looked away. Do you know that not one of your ex-wives had a good word to say about you, Chris? Not a single good word. Now that's quite revelatory, don't you think? So that's it. You're just going to tell your mother that my exes all hate me because I cheated on them. Is that all you've got on me? That's not very promising. I'll just tell your mother that it's all a lie, every single word of it. Oh, there is more, Chris, I said. Much, much more. And at that I pulled out my cell phone and proudly showed him the evidence of his roaming hands, groping young woman. Chris's face went as white as a ghost, and he looked mortified. Where did you get this from? He said, trying to grab my phone from me. At that, a scuffle began, as Chris began to tackle me for the phone, and I suddenly realised his intention was to throw it in the lake to eliminate all the evidence. In seconds, a brawl began between the two of us, and so I ran away as fast as I could through the wood green with Chris hot on my trail. My brother just stood back watching the commotion with a look of horror on his face. All I remember is sprinting away from that lake as fast as I could as the adrenaline surged through my system. I quickly hid the phone under a nearby rock because that's exactly what Chris was after. The next thing I knew was that Chris was on top of me and had me pinned to the ground like a lion tackling its prey. He began punching me so hard and the pain that exploded through my body was excruciating. The next thing I knew, he was hammering my head against the rock. Where is your cell phone? he screamed. Where is it? Give it to me now. Where is it? I've hidden it, I told him proudly. At this, his jaw tightened and his face grew crimson with rage and he began to beat my head against the rock and I was blindly aware that if he throttled me any harder, he might succeed in killing me and a horrifying thought wafted in my mind like an unpleasant odorous smell. Supposing that was his intention all along, Chris could kill me and my brother and make out that we had drowned during the fishing. I wouldn't put anything past that duplicitous, guileful man who was capable of anything nefarious as far as I was concerned. My thoughts were suddenly interrupted by the most discomposing, terrifying growl that was so petrifying that we immediately stopped fighting and looked up to find ourselves staring into the face of a belligerent, very disgruntled Bigfoot. I was dumbfounded and astonished. I'd never envisaged that Bigfoot was anything other than a creature of fiction. But now, now I was within touching distance of this incongruous, majestic, masterful and lofty beast. And being in his presence was like being up and close and personal with a wild lion. I cannot remember a time in my life that I was more terrified. The light of the head torch made me see the creature very clearly. He was easily over ten foot tall and was standing over us, staring at us with deep-set dark eyes that seemed to sear through us almost as if he was reading our very souls. The creature's breathing was very heavy and I could smell his warm breath which was strangely unoffensive, as was his body odour, which rather was like sweat mixed with the woody, citrusy notes of pine, and not like the sulphurous rank smells that are so often described on other Bigfoot encounters. The creature was covered from head to toe with long flowing hair, 
which appeared matted in various places. The torso area on his body was very pronounced. He was thick-set and burly, and the shoulders were excessively large, while the overlong arms and legs were strong but lean and lanky. The creature had a very distinguished pyramid-shaped head with a pointed tip that could literally swivel from left to right like an owl, and a very human-like face with a prominent brow ridge that was heavily wrinkled and a very flat, firm nose. As we raised ourselves off the ground, we both ran backwards, but the Bigfoot's eyes were not pinned on me. They were pinned on Chris. And it was as if something about him enraged him so much and ruffled his feathers. The only way I can describe it to you is that the Bigfoot expressed an extreme dislike and almost revulsion towards Chris. He made a beeline for the man, grabbing him in his strong, powerful hands. And Chris began to scream and scream at the top of his lungs, while the creature let out the most horrifying growl that sent shivers of dread down my spine and caused my skin to break out in goose pumps, and I began to convulse with terror like a jelly. The next thing I knew was that the creature ran off with Chris dangling over his shoulders into the woods and towards the lake. And then I heard the sound of water splashing and I realised that the Bigfoot had offloaded Chris into the lake. I bolted as fast as I could through the woods down the hiking trail towards the lake and that was where I saw the Bigfoot standing on the grassy embankment, swaying the branch of a spruce tree backwards and forwards, watching the body of Chris floating with his head under the water and blood pooling around it. I realised that Chris almost certainly was dead, and in truth I felt nothing. No regret, no disappointment, no guilt, just nothing. The creature looked satisfied by the sight of Chris's body being swept away by what seemed like a feisty current, as the wind had increased in intensity, and glanced up at me and looked at me with the kindest, warmest eyes I've ever seen. Yet moments before, he had been brutally savage towards Chris. I can only assume he considered Chris to be like a bad egg, and let's face it, he really was. Perhaps he'd picked up the dark, negative energy and was eager to dispose of it. To cut a long story short, the coroner put down Chris's death as an accidental drowning due to hitting his head hard on a rock and becoming disorientated and concussed. Of course, I knew what really had happened, but I was heartily relieved I didn't have the evidence to show my mother about Chris's philandering ways, as the less she knew about what had really happened, the better. Ironically, after Chris's death, my mother didn't appear too distressed, which really surprised me. She finally did get to marry a wonderful man five years after that, and she privately confided in me once that she was so relieved she never ended up marrying Chris Tedder. There was something about him that was rarely off, she told me. Little did she realise how on the money she was. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what a fabulous story. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, goodbye and good night. Goodbye.